like I'm back not teaching because I never taught, but <laughs> trying to corral a group of people. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. I'm Cami Vale, Executive Director of the Palo Alto Community Fund. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come today, and I hope we are going to provide you with a fulfilling workshop this morning. Um, it wasn't it kind of nice to see the the rain in the air, I kind of feel like it's finally fall, so um, looking forward to some more rain for us that we always seem to need. The Palo Alto Community Fund is thrilled to be co-sponsoring our training event again with the Sobrato Family Foundation, and we are equally thrilled to be co-sponsoring this event with the American Leadership Forum for the first time. Thank you to Mara Williams-Lowe and Suzanne St. John Crane and their staffs for working so closely with us for putting this together. The topic of today's event is Stronger Together, the case for strategic collaboration. The topic was chosen because we all have seen what the power of collaboration can do to strengthen nonprofits, thus strengthening our communities, whether it be shared programming or full integration. There is not a one-size-fits-all collaboration for all of you in this room, but we will be providing you with a framework for determining which types of partnerships might be right for your organization. Our goal is to share with you concrete examples to illustrate the range of opportunities available, and we also hope that you will leave today with practical tools to help assess when it is the right time to partner or collaborate and how to build the trust and conditions necessary to embark on a new partnership. All of you in this room are already improving our communities through your actions, and I want to applaud and thank you for all the impact that you are doing. I hope that this session will give you a few more tools to work with moving forward. For those of you joining the Palo Alto Community Fund for our afternoon session, it will be held right across the driveway in the Bay Room. And I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Suzanne St. John Crane will be the panel moderator today. Suzanne is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Leadership Forum, Forum Silicon Valley. Suzanne joined ALF in March of 2016, having completed both the Classic class and the Urbanism class of ALF. Prior to ALF, Suzanne worked in community media for the last 24 years and served as the founding executive director for two community television stations in the Bay Area. Louis, I'm gonna do this right, Louis. No, sequence, sequence, sequence. Louis sequence. Okay, you all try this. <laughs> um, is the executive director of Adobe Services. Louis has led Adobe Services for more than 20 years. During his tenure, Adobe Services has grown from a local startup with one shelter serving 66 adults and children into a regional organization that owns and operates hundreds of supportive housing units and provides services to more than 6,100 adults and children each year. Eileen Richardson is the founder and CEO of the Downtown Street team. Eileen launched Downtown Streets with a team of four in 2005, and today the Streets team operates in 12 cities and seven counties in California and two in Florida. Randy Shafton is the executive director of Peninsula Bridge, a college, college access organization based in Palo Alto. Randy joined the organization in 2013, and before joining Peninsula Bridge, she was the co-development director at the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula. Alan Austin is the board chair of Peninsula Bridge. Alan has, has an extensive resume with previous positions such as managing director at Silver Lake, a private equity firm, general partner at Excel, a venture capital firm, and before he has practiced securities laws for 25 years. I would now like to welcome all the speakers to the stage and I wanna thank each and every one of you for participating in this today. Good morning. So I don't know about you, but my commute started with, you will arrive at 9.09. <laughs> and then it was, you will arrive at 9.40. And I ended up landing at about 9.29, so winning, hashtag winning. But it's, it's uh, quite, a, quite a journey to get here, isn't it? 
it's great to see familiar faces and new faces, and I look forward to an inspired day of learning today, and um, the spirit of really working towards fulfilling our missions and our and our sector, and and uh, kind of exploring what the possibilities are out there. What are the possibilities? What if? How might we? How might we together get to the finish line and accomplish more than we ever would by ourselves and our own organizations? So I'm delighted to have these four stellar individuals here on the panel today. And we're going we're gonna to do something first, though, because we want to kind of see, get a little, know who you are a little bit before we start uh, with, with the panel. So we have a polling. Uh, here we go. Yes, a polling uh, that we want to do with you all. Um, so let's start with this question, and there's going to be directions that are going to come up here in just a second about how to actually take this poll. And again, this kind of gives us a sense of, of uh, who's in the room, what's our experience with collaboration, uh, what's our experience with, with merging with another organization, uh, does it give you a tension headache, does it <laughs> <laughs> cause a pain in your stomach? Do you jump for joy yeah, when somebody exactly. says, let's, you know, is, is I play, you know, plays well together on your resume or not so much? So we're going to explore that here in a second. Um, we had the agenda up there for just a, uh, just a moment, and so I can go back to that real quick uh, before we jump into the poll. So what, what I'm going to do is just we're going to start with the poll, set the stage, and then talk with Lewis and talk with Eileen about their particular uh, collaboration and their experience in, in that arena and then talk with a very interesting uh, merger case study uh, with Randy and with Alan. And then we're going to open up for Q&A. So I don't want to do a ton of the talking here. I want you to be able to participate and actually ask the questions here because there's a lot to learn from these four individuals here on the stage. So, uh, And then uh, we will go into some small group dialogue because at ALF we're big on dialogue. So uh, get ready to participate and share some of your stories and your, your, your thoughts and your questions on the subject. Okay, so how many of us have taken a text poll before? Okay, if this is not clear to you, find the millennial nearest to you <laughs> and ask for help in a very authentic, vulnerable way Seems like so that you can collaborate time. today. <laughs> or struggle on your own, right? Uh, funny story about that, but I'll show that later. Okay, so let's join the conversation. What you do is text Sobrato FDN to 22333. Okay, Sobrato FDN to 22333 to join the conversation. Okay, so that's step one. Uh, it looks like uh, we've got a few uh, hashtags or we've got a few. Um, uh, Twitter handles up here, so please do use that too. This is very much about sharing the love, sharing the uh, the knowledge. So please feel free to take pictures and post and <laughs> and uh, uh, share the knowledge out with your your networks. Okay, question number one. Here we go, guys. Are you engaged in a collaboration, partnership, or merger currently, or have you engaged in one in the past? Have you played with others? Okay. Well, we have one respondent saying yes. <laughs> They were quick. Yeah. Fast. They're, they're good. Yeah. A couple no's. There's a no. We'll give it a bit here just to see. And that might mean a collaboration could be as simple as, you know, we did an event together or uh, uh, we, we put a joint communication out together. Uh, we went full on in a program together. Uh, we, I merged organizations. It was a big deal. It was a big collaboration, so it can be a number of things. So most of you have done this in one form or another, it looks like. 85% say yes, and a few folks haven't yet. So uh, we look, look forward to, to having that conversation together. Okay, next question here. Of those who have or are participating in a collaboration, partnership, or merger, tell us, how'd it go? Accomplished all of your objectives? Accomplished some of the objectives? Did not accomplish its objectives, but led to unexpected success? That can happen when we are open to the possibilities, uh, did not accomplish its objectives, and I'm kind of bitter and angry about it. No, that was my <laughs> two cents. <laughs> That's never happened to me. Let's take a look and see where we land here. And as you do these polls, and as you engage in the conversation today, uh, and the sharing out, I, I just want to invite you all, I want to invite you all to really be authentic in this, okay? Let's, let's leave our guard out there 
for this conversation as much as we can. And I realize there are people in the room who are probably going, you're going up against for you know, responding to RFPs and grant applications that you in the past may have considered or your organization considers a competitor in this space. I've been on boards and been on organizations where that's the case. And as much as you can today, please be open to the possibilities and being authentic in your responses and your answers and what you share. Okay, because I think we're all going to benefit from that, that authenticity and vulnerability. Okay, when you hear the word collaboration, this is my favorite. I wish I could participate in this one. <laughs> <clears throat> what is the one, I love these things, what is the one word or phrase that immediately comes to mind? Your word choice will appear on the screen. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability, yes. Support, trust, good work. It's okay if you say headache, please. Mm. Authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> Unpredictability, strategic possibilities. Gosh, it looks like we all came to play today. These are great words. What else do we see? Tough, yep. Impact, energy. Awesome. And again, this can, this can be as small as a one and done kind of a collaboration or a major multi-year or permanent merger. Hard, progress, active. Aggravation, there we go. <laughs> Get more real. Get more real. Okay. Struggle. It is a struggle. It's a struguggle to stay in those conversations and, and get to the answer, right? Win-win partners. This is great. Partnership's the big one. Partnership is the big one. A lot of folks saying that. And how even are the partnerships, right? How balanced are they? You know, some of the thoughts I've had as I've prepared for this um, uh, this panel and really having phone conversations with folks here. When I'm in these conversations about collaboration, is it just the big dog in the room that has the voice in the floor? Or am I open to making sure everyone's heard? Am I open to really paying attention to who's in the room and who's not in the room? I'm kind of thinking twice about who we invite and making sure that we have proper representation, fair representation, and are open to those possibilities. I've thought about collective impact as a model and recollective way of work, which is really based in relationship, shared power. Leaving your ego at the door, it's not easy. Leadership really matters in these circumstances, and we're gonna hear those themes run through, I think, our panel today. Thanks for sharing your words. I think we're gonna jump in now to talk with Lewis and Eileen. Awesome. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say, when Mara and um, I think it was Mara who called me, or Catherine, one of you, uh, called and said, hey, Suzanne, do you think you could moderate this? I said, yeah, and the first, I'm just going to be totally honest here, the first people that came to mind, of course, are from my own personal experience. I was the board chair at home first um, for a couple of years and on the board for six years and have a real strong connection to the, the cause of, of homelessness. And this was several years ago. And you know, our organization was going through a CEO transition and kind of exploring what was going to be next. And I, I hearkened back to this conversation that I had with board chairs and executive directors of like-minded organizations. It was actually at Create TV, I believe, in our conference room, where we got real vulnerable and put our cards on the table about what was going on. God, that was hard. But it was so necessary, and we came to this point in our organization where, hey, we, we got we to compare notes. We have, to, we have to talk. And what I witnessed in that conversation, and I use the two of you as kind of a primary example here, is every, because our organization was ready to get vulnerable, others joined in, and all of a sudden, we were trading resources at the table. And this is prior to really having, I think, a, a strong relationship that, was, that went deep. And so that, to me, was just the payoff was, was really remarkable, and I think a great example of what's possible. And I'm just going to share this, Lewis, because you could stop me, but not really. Um, when, at one point, and you'll relate to this, right? At one point, I want to say there were three or four organizations in our space that were all looking for CFOs. Does this sound familiar? I mean, the pipeline problem is real, and it was very real for our organization at the time. And I can distinctly remember Lewis saying, if you need to borrow ours or if we can be helpful, Let's talk about that, right? And these are organizations that went up against each other in grant applications and RFPs, but you know what? 
<coughs> Lewis, to your credit, and other folks in the room and your board, the big picture was clear. We're not here for abode. We're here for the mission. We're here to end homelessness. So I use that as an example to kick this off. Um, and that's why you two are here today. Right. So, <laughs> and here we are. So Lewis um, and Eileen, I want to start off by just kind of setting the stage. I'm sure many of you are familiar with their organizations, but it's helpful a little bit to just understand the, the size and scope of what they do. So um, Lewis, your organization abodes in five counties. You have a $70 million budget and 350 employees. And since embracing that housing first model, moving away from just shelter and going to housing first, uh, over the last 15 years, you've seen double digit increases uh, along the way. I mean, it's been a, you've never looked back, although shelter is still a very important part of what you do. Clearly, housing is the answer to, to, to get to the finish line here. And, uh, and then Eileen, downtown streets team, $8 million budget. You've been around 10 years, you're in seven counties, you have 53 employees. Um, you've had to play well with others. You've had to make decisions about this. So let's start there. With all these opportunities coming at you and all the possibilities, and you're, both of you are grappling with what I would say is the issue of our time, <laughs> the issue of our region, which is housing and homelessness. How do you determine whether or not to collaborate with somebody and even merge with an organization? What are the ingredients that have to be there? What's your process? Uh, Lewis, I'll start with you. I was gonna say, uh Given last week, we should start with Eileen, but. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Yeah. Oh, Danny. I getcha. Yeah, and yeah. the issue of our time is the Supreme Court. Not, yeah, not yeah, not yeah, yeah, right. I'm trying Come to block that out. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's be here now. Okay, let's, okay, all right. <laughs> Why don't you start? Eileen, I think Lewis would be more sure. comfortable if you start. <laughs> sure. Um, well, yes. Downtown Streets team does just one thing, um, yeah. and that is give homeless men and women an opportunity to volunteer in their communities to clean up. It's, uh, it sounds easy, but it's hard to do um, in, in having a team that has, uh, is self-managed out there. Um, and um, we're learning in all the cities, uh, we'll launch in Oakland next week, we just launched in Berkeley, um, San Francisco, Sacramento, Santa Cruz, um, that it's a missing link, really. And what we do is provide a life raft, sort of on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where we really focus on uh, food and shelter initially, and then um, get people to the place where they can start working on other issues. And so in all of the cities we're in, we have to partner deeply for housing, food, you know, sometimes food, um, wh whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So we just mm -hmm. go in with a very uh, open mind. I will say that in most cities initially, people don't like us um, because we're the new shiny thing. So all the existing uh, nonprofits, until they get to know us, I will say, um, initially, initially are like, oh, who are they? They're taking all our money, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it's hard, it's hard to uh, work around that, but um, we've been successful so far in partnering. What are the ingredients that need to exist for you to say yes to an opportunity like that to partner? Um, trust, definitely. Okay. Um, we want to make sure our brand stays um, true. So we, so we worry about, you know, the brand. Um, we want to know that we have, uh, throughout the agency, um, mm -hmm. our employees can sort of work with their employees. So um, having experience with that really helps too. Um, mm -hmm. And sound financial position mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And Lewis, you, had a whole, you have a whole criteria, I think, that you described to me on the phone just about what ingredients need to exist or need to be there uh, for yeah. you to consider this. Yeah. So uh, we've, we've been involved in four merger attempts, three of them successful, <laughs> and one was ended by a government bureaucrat who didn't want it to move forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, that latter was, experience was full of lessons. But So uh, we have that level of deep uh, learnings from uh, trying to come together. But we partner every day in many ways. And I, I have to say real quickly, uh, before I get to specifics around criteria, that uh, Eileen um, and Downtown Streets, the reason that they're successful at partnership is that they're, they know what they're about. So that's actually one of our principles. We want to partner with people who aren't doing one thing and saying they're something else. Mm. And in the nonprofit sector, there is a lot of that. And it, some, some of it is you're trying to please foundations or you're 
pleasing individual right. donors. Your, maybe your government entity that's funding you is, is telling you you ought to be this, and really the only way you can do your work is this over here. So people get sort of put into these uh, places. Right. Um, Eileen, I've always experienced her as being very clear about what they do and what they don't do. And so that's the basis for a partnership because we're not doing, my organization's housing homeless people. Her organization is really looking at the, the front end, the dignity, engaging people on the streets. So we do some of that work. Mm -hmm. um, we do it from more of a clinical perspective. But the way they do the work uh, is an incredible asset to uh, building trust with the population we're working with. Um, so right there, um, there's not an unnecessary competition, is mm -hmm. how I put it, mm -hmm. with the entity, w with the two entities, right? So you, right. You, you know what you're about, you can work within your lane, and you um, don't have to, let's, let's say it, uh, have to directly compete with each other for the same uh, resources, because you're basically going to Right. Respond to different uh, funding app, uh, opportunities. Your your pitch to your donor base is going to be yours. Um, so those those are the other principle that we have that we've learned over the years. Right? And I should add real quickly: we have a million dollars in our budget that are subcontracts, mm -hmm. and those are that's just legal language for a partnership that has yep. money yep. involved. <laughs> and in those relationships, we found um, it's really important to have savvy business uh, capacity on the other side of the relationship, particularly when money is involved. You can't just pretend like everything is, uh, we do this sometimes in the nonprofit sector, you know, we all like each other, and we're doing good work, that's enough. So another principle we have is we look for uh, partnerships that uh, involve people who have the capacity to be in, in a in a sophisticated business relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, that means reporting and, right. and uh, you know, our side, it's often paying on time and that, that sort of thing. Sure, it was interesting. Uh, Silicon Valley Council Nonprofits years ago put out a report that said, don't forget when you're talking about these collaborations that might be imposed upon you, right, by a grant or by a government saying, we will give you more points if you play well with others and collaborate. Don't forget to build in the money that it's gonna cost for that collaboration and what they were, were, were suggesting is that it could be as much as 15 to 20 percent of the project budget. And I thought that was really interesting. I had not heard that before. Now, whether an organization would be successfully um, funded <laughs> when requesting that, I think there's something to be said about actually educating uh, whether it's, <clears throat> excuse me, foundations or whether it's government that, hey, this also costs. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. So let me ask you both, too, in terms of the, um, you talked about protecting your brand, mm -hmm. and I totally get that, and I, I completely understand that. You've got to be careful who you play with and how. But at the same time, do you find, Eileen, that you've experienced, you become so protective, and be as honest as you can here, be so protective of downtown streets, for instance, that it's hard to navigate between caring so much for the brand versus what's our real mission here? How do you grapple with that balance? Does that make sense? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, um, well, it's it's hard. I will say when I first got into this industry, I came from the cutthroat world of um, international high-tech venture capital. Um, so it, so I, I thought that we were going to sing Kumbaya and hold hands. And I was shocked beyond belief at the competition and the sheer disdain the two major agencies had for each other in, in the county of Santa Clara in mm. particular. Um, it was intense and it was not helping anybody. Right. And now there are new leaders um, in, in some of these agencies and things are just incredibly um, more, more impactful than they ever were before. And it is a lot what you said, Lewis, it's staying in your lane. I remember when Bruce mm. Ives took over Life Moves, it was initially um, what, do, what do we keep? What don't we keep? Yeah. You know, what are we really good at? Let's do more of that. Right. Um, right. So he's a, a comes from a business background as well. So um, yeah, those those things are important. One more question, just based on the uh, using your 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 uh, collaboration with Opportunity Center. I think that's a good a good case mm -hmm. study. So Eileen, as I understand it, you were sort of already in there and you were collaborating with them, and the idea of calling and bringing on abode came up. Talk, tell that story. How did that well, happen? The Opportunity Center is 
one of the most complex deals on the planet. It is. It has about six or seven stakeholders. Uh, the community working group founded it, so they really own it. Okay. But Life Moves is the provider of services on the first floor. We run the medical clinic. <laughs> Abode runs <laughs> the building. Uh, you know, upstairs from the second floor up. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. But it, and it, there have been tough times, sure. um, especially around fundraising. CWG wants to fundraise because it's their building and they want to keep the lights on. I'm sure Life Moves would like to fundraise for mm -hmm. all the services it provides that aren't funded. Mm -hmm. And I know we at the clinic do too. So um, that has been really hard to navigate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure it's not worked out yet even. Yeah. Still, yeah. and that's you know 12 years mm -hmm. ago <laughs> that the building was built. Yeah, and that's real. Yeah. <laughs> that's real. Right. Your, your perspective on this, Lewis, and how you came. Yeah, just to give a little more context, the yep. Opportunity Center is the first permanent supportive housing project uh, on the peninsula and in Santa Clara County as well. It'll be 100% uh, permanent supportive housing for homeless people. And so it's a pretty powerful building. The community working group was, a, was just that, a <laughs> group of community members who uh, worked really hard together uh, as volunteers to get the money together to build this project. Um, and they had hoped to do more projects like uh, op the Opportunity Center, but uh, realized after many years that you know, the whole area of housing development's been professionalized to a degree that they couldn't do that. So they uh, sought out partners. They chose Abode as their uh, partner. Um, and we did a, what's called a strategic alliance. Um, it's basically a merger but it's a language we use, and that kind of gets at this whole idea of collaboration. Uh, merger is loaded language, right? From the, the for-profit sector, it's takeover. You think of all the things, if we right. put up a, a word salad up there uh, for merger, it would be loaded with pretty aggressive negative language. So the idea is to really respect the, uh, the goldenness of each entity. You know, and again, it's this mm -hmm. sense of the community working group had this community connection. It had an uh, incredible resource in its board, uh, Stanford, uh, other folks, uh, highly educated, thoughtful, engaged mm -hmm. people in their community. And Abode had uh, this development experience, the service experience with the population. And so um, there you go. We got one plus one equals something more than two when you come together. So uh, I would say that the challenge has been uh, the, the existing, respecting the existing relationships on the property. Having mm. medical services, for example, on the property like that is, is really hard to do. And so the, the fact that Elaine's organization was uh, willing and able to do that was important for us to try to preserve that. Um, and, and hopefully we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. And, so, yeah, being then, respectful of the folks that are already there yeah, and the work exactly. that's being done and how do we play well together. And, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a work in process, I, right. would, I would say, um, as all these partners should be, partnerships will likely be. Right. The more complex they are, the more you're going to be in that category that what you think is mm -hmm. going to be the outcome probably will change and more from mm -hmm. time. And Lewis, a final question here too. You had come, when we chatted on the phone, you had said that your organization, it's not in writing, but you kind of, you sit down with your senior staff or, or with a representation from a boat and you say, okay, here's the, here's the filter, right? These are the things that need to be if we're really going to go for this. Can you briefly describe what the, that list is? Yeah, I mean, we start with uh, the sophistication of the partner. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mm -hmm. You know, and I sort of alluded to that earlier. Uh, it, to put it crassly, uh, take it inside the, our executive team, we say, are they adults? Huh? You, know, okay, are, <laughs> you know, are they going to be the sort of people we're in a squabble with a year from now because they're trying to protect something that's okay. sacred? Uh, or are they people who will adapt and, and work with us uh, to get some, to something that, that's better? Meaningful. That's the first question. So it's about the people. Yep. Uh, the, the second thing we, we talk about, just financially, um, can, do they have the resources? Do they have the internal capacity on their finance yeah. side, on their leadership side? Is their leadership uh, stable? Or are they going through a lot of change? Yeah. So we look at that uh, and do an assessment there. What's their reputation? And I think uh, Elaine was referring to that before. Uh, 
Have they uh, burned bridges in the community? Are they known as the one who jumps ahead of the government mm. worker and goes to the elected official um, too quickly? And they have a reputation mm. with people we need to work with um, in order to get things done. That's not, a reputation's not so hot, so we'll look at that. And we'll look at their board. You know, is, is the board holding, right. is there like, life there on the board, or is it mm -hmm. uh, folks have been around for 20 years and holding on for dear life to the way it was 20 years ago? Right, right. So those are some of the, those are some of the elements of our conversation. No, it's really helpful just from a tactical perspective. You know, how do we even start this conversation and consider if this is somebody we wanna, we wanna play with? I wanna thank you too for, for sharing that and, and move on to our other two panelists here, but certainly pipe in if you've got something to add. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had a conversation with, with, uh, with Randy and Alan and about the merger between uh, Building Futures Now or the strategic alliance with Building <laughs> yeah. Futures Now and with uh, uh, Peninsula Bridge. And, and leadership matters. Leadership matters and relationships matter. And I think we're, gonna, we're going to see a great example of that here. So welcome. Thank you, too, for being here. Um, Alan, I'd like to start with you. How, how did this all begin? How did this conversation start? You were the board chair at the sure. time at Peninsula Bridges, so talk to us about that. Sure. Um, uh, and we, have, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of partnerships too. You're talking about, but right. this is we're here to talk about one that was really a merger. It was the, the you know, full, uh, full on. Um, so, the vulnerability, the lack of ego, uh, those kinds of words that were up uh, on the board, I think, uh, were illustrated. Uh, by the board of the other organization here, Building Futures Now, or BFN as people call it. Yeah. Uh, uh, their board chair is someone I had known, I know both her and her husband professionally for many years, not friends personally really, but known them and respected them, knew of them. Right. Uh, and, and Penny, the board chair, Penny Gallo, uh, called me and said, Alan, uh, you know, I'm the board chair of BFN. Uh, which, as I knew, had it was a very similar organization to ours. Same mission, similar strategy, same territory. I mean, they're East Palo Alto, we're East Palo Alto, and, and other mid peninsula. So we had, we're bigger. We had at that point uh, probably more than 500 students in our program. This is college access. You start with grade school students and stick with them all the way through college. Right. Um, and uh, they had maybe 100 kids. We had over 500 at that point. She, she says, let's, let's get together and have a cup of coffee. Yep. Uh, so you, you could argue we're sort of rivals. I mean, we're bigger, but they're doing the same thing we're doing and going to a lot of the similar same missions, fun, the same similar, people yeah. providing the money and yeah. so on. Yeah. Um, and I just really want to give her and her board a shout out because uh, it says, you know, Alan, like, like you, we've been around for 25 plus years. Uh, similar strategy, we're doing the same thing. Uh, we took a hard look in the mirror and we said, you know, we're subscale. Uh, we could do what we do a lot better if we were bigger. And uh, it's not easy to be bigger. That's a that's a big a big McGill line, you know, to take on. How do you get how do you get from 100 kids to where we were 500 kids or more? Uh, and we think it might make more sense to combine. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was taken aback, uh, but. Just think about that for a minute. The lack of ego is saying what's better for the clients here, not, and not what's better for the board members or the people who were the founders or the people who've been hanging around doing this for a long time. Uh, not even for the staff, because of course part of being more efficient means that you're probably, there are probably going to be at least a few people who, who wind up getting laid off in the context of something like this. It's really what's better, what's better for the clients, the, the, for the students. Maybe you can they move your mic up. I'm sorry. Just I'm, move it up I think here. they're going to try and right. uh, turn it up a little bit. Is All right. Me? Let me. Uh, Thanks. So it took. If I, if I move it up. So, ego yeah, so, right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I was taken aback, but I said, well, all right, let's, uh, you know, let's think about it. Is that better? Yes. Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Um, and, um, uh, and it proceeded yeah. from there. It happened and over a period of a few months. I think what's interesting, mm -hmm. too, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what a courageous move, right? What a courageous mm -hmm. move. And, and it, it took a little bit of courage on Peninsula Bridge's part to say, yeah, let's sit down and do this. But as you pointed out, Alan, it really took a lot of courage on Building Futures Now part and for the board chair and the executive to be able to say, hey, 
this is what's best. We're not putting our organization and our brand at the center, but we're putting our, our, our mission at the center. And our kids, yeah, the our, kids our clients, the, kids, the right? clients that we're so, serving, yeah. Randy, share with me, so you're a co-executive director, which is a whole other level of collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you talk to Randy about that. I've not done that before, but very intriguing. Um, how did you, you know, you've got two different organizations, very potentially very different cultures, values as organizations. Mm -hmm. How did you merge the staff? How did that, how did that happen and how well did it go or not? Yeah, I think what was really key is, um, you know, again, back to Alan's point, I think the self-reflection was so key, yeah. you know, on, on the part of the organization, both the board and the staff and really looking at um, where, where is the expertise amongst the staff, right? What expertise right. do they have? Um, and uh, what did, you know, who on the team is sort of the best cultural fit to come over to this, you know, next combined mm -hmm. organization? And I think there were a key individuals there, um, a retention, retention bonuses and stay bonuses um, really did help, obviously, uh, provide, you know, incentive for the key staff members to stay on, to be above board, to be mature adults. Um, you know, and a stay to, bonus would be leave, you know, paying the other executive to stay on. Yeah, for, exactly. Don't, don't, leave before, don't leave before some date after the merger has been accomplished. Uh, yeah, so in the executive director yeah. was key, and I have to, again, another shout out. She was amazing. She was super collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, she was leaving, but she really rolled up her sleeves and helped us um, during this transition and integration. And so I think identifying these, these key um, staff members who we knew had solid expertise, really strong relationships with the students and the families in the community, that was key because we needed them to be ambassadors. We needed them to sell this new brand, right, this new organization. It was absolutely essential. And I think what was super key is that we held a number of community meetings um, for the students and families where together the Peninsula Bridge and Building Futures Now staff members stood up as a united front with confidence, basically saying to the community, you know, we believe in this. We believe in this new organization, this new future. Um, you know, we're, we're buying into this and it's going to be better in the long run, right? And so they were really looking at the end run, um, getting over kind of the loss, the grief, and there was a lot of that. There was a lot of emotion, but they were really able essentially to stand up. And that, that was so important because I think of all the different constituent groups, the donors, the students, the families, the community partners, the school partners, they could look to the staff and they could read them, you know, the, 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 you know, the verbal, the nonverbal cues. Um, to, to really see, you know, hey, do, do, do they trust this, this future and, and believe in it? Um, and that, that was good. I mean, back to the vulnerability piece, it, it wasn't easy, honestly. There was, there was a lot of loss. Um, and for the staff at Building Futures Now, again, they had a 28-year-plus history in the community. The founders came from Stanford Business School. They were a strong cohort. Um, they were the visionaries behind this organization, and the staff had been there for years, right? So they were leaving a long history, um, a long vision behind. And so they, and it was in East Palo Alto, Peninsula Bridge is broader. We serve students from San Mateo um, all the way to Mountain View, including East Palo Alto, but we're a much broader geographic organization. Right. And right. Um, so anyway, there were, there were feelings of loss and, and grief, and I think we, we had to make sure we validated that. Um, and one of the points you brought up, too, uh, during our call, which I think, think is really important, it's not just the executive, right? If you've got boots-on-the-ground staff that actually have the relationships with these families, I mean, that's super important because mm -hmm. they are, I mean, that's, that's the buy-in, right? I think, Alan, you had said, uh, you had said on the call too when we were talking about how do you measure success? Everybody's getting along, we're fundraising. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's not how we measure success. You measure success mm -hmm. by how many students, right? Stay. That's, well, and we've got, it, you should tell about the, yeah. the uh, survey and so on too. Yeah, so we've we, got, it, we're a year in now, and we, so we've had 85% retention. So 85% of the building future now, students and families have stayed with us. That's key. And I think, again, the, the key piece is the relationship to, you know, Maria Rodriguez, who's the middle school director who came over. But the other piece of it is that we were very lucky. We partnered actually with, with Sobrato on this. Um, we received um, a Listen for Good grant, which is um, mm -hmm. an initiative that focuses on customer feedback. Um, and we'll, it's, it's used in the private sector, but they're really looking at the social um, service sector to apply the same net promoter, the NPS score, um, to, to the social sector. So it was super interesting as we actually did a survey. Peninsula Bridge is very metrics driven, and so we did a survey twice in this last year. And what we learned was 
that 86, per, no, sorry about that, 96% of the Building Future Now students um, feels very connected to their peers, to the cohort. They feel a strong sense um, of, um, I'm sorry, sorry about that. They feel um, that there's a huge value in the Peninsula Bridge service and program um, and a great deal of respect. Um, they feel a great deal of respect from, from the Peninsula Bridge staff. Yeah, let's talk about money for a second because I think it's really important to understand that any of these endeavors, as we talked about from the yeah. Council on Nonprofits uh, study around programmatic collaboration to full out full on mergers, this is not an inexpensive endeavor. If you're going to do this right, um, it, it can cost some money. And I think what was interesting, Alan, and you could mm -hmm. kind of talk about mm -hmm. this is, you know, this can take time. This can take a lot of time. How do you manage two organizations or an organization and, and the, the brand and the relationships during that? that period of time, and it can be expensive. You all did this fairly inexpensively in a six month period. How'd you do it? Well, there are a bunch of pieces. Uh, first of all, it, it, uh, uh, there's a lot of work involved, obviously, it, to the extent you can get people to do it without charging you for it, uh, mm -hmm. that is critical. And, and, and that comes up in a couple of different ways. You need people on the boards of the two organizations who have some experience, hopefully, in, in doing yeah. deals. Uh, so and who can well, volunteer? <laughs> well, you know, people with business business kinds yes. of backgrounds, they yeah. they can step up, and they're not, you know, they're doing, they're spending hours and hours on this, and it's free because they're yeah. they're they're volunteers. Uh, there's a ton of legal work involved, even though there aren't very many zeros in this in terms of the size of the right. of the uh, organizations and so on. Uh, both sides need to have uh, capable lawyers, and what you really need is for the lawyers to do it pro bono. And that can be done. I mean, these law firms are, are they're delighted. This is something they know how to do. They know how to put organizations together. They do that all the time. And they're happy to do it for free because they, they want to serve uh, the community. If the legal fees to do this little merger of these two small nonprofits uh, would have been in six figures, uh, maybe even yep, yep. Mi middle six figures <laughs> if this was like a full bore corporate uh, kind of transaction, it was free. We didn't pay a nickel uh, because the law firm stepped up and, and did it pro bono. That's Board key. Board members matter. <laughs> Board members, well, yeah, but I mean the firms are the firms are eager yeah. to do this, and yeah, you hopefully you have people in your in your uh, orbit who have connections to law firms. Um, the other thing is we had we had uh, consultants who were very helpful around some of the HR issues. Um, that's not free either, but we were able to get uh, grants from Sobrato and from Sand Hill uh, mm. to cover the cost of that because uh, the, the foundations think it's great. You know, this consolidation is something that they're, they're in favor of. Um, and the other, co the other cost that you really have to just budget for is, uh, the, Randy alluded to, is, is having, you're, you're gonna, some people are going to get laid off probably. Yep. And so you need to be you need to be very responsible about that, right? I mean, it's 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 just the right way to be, and it also helps the whole thing be successful because they're going to be much more supportive and cooperative if they feel like they're being treated fairly. So you you need to have generous severance arrangements. You need to have stay bonuses for the people who uh, probably are going to be leaving, but you want them uh, mm -hmm. you want them to at least stay until until it's over. Uh, even the stay bonuses are valuable even for people who aren't going to be leaving because they're unsure. They're feeling, they're feeling like, I don't know, maybe what, what yeah, should I do? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and knowing that uh, they have some financial incentive to stick around and see how it's all going to work right. uh, makes, it, makes it easier for them. We are going to do questions, Q&A from the audience in just a second. Um, I want to jump in with one last question, maybe for the four of you on this. I think this is... Um, a couple of very different examples in terms of how we collaborate. I mean, we can go on about programmatic collaboration and the need for, for solid communication and, and, and very uh, clear communication as uh, to, to be clear to your clients and your, your constituents. Um, my question, though, I want to sneak in here is um, what didn't go well and what did you learn? In two minutes or less. <laughs> We could do a word clap, no. Yeah, I, I, I'd be glad to share. I have a board member here, here with me um, who came through a merger. Um, yeah. Actually, we had worked with Ann Danner previously. Others of you might remember uh, Ann's uh, uh, an experienced uh, fundraiser and, and been very involved in the nonprofit sector in the Bay Area. 
So um, we we did a merger with an organization called HIP. It's not the San Mateo HIP. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, based in Santa Clara County. And um, to make a long story short, uh, the board three board members decided that they didn't uh, want to continue the conversation. They weren't really engaging in the merger conversation, mm -hmm. but they decided that it wasn't a good idea. And it was probably led by a particular staff person uh, that was feeding them some information, misinformation about what was going on. And I was, Ann and I were just reminiscing about this, what the way we dealt with that, yeah. um, and it was a successful strategy, was to just stick to our process, to allow people mm -hmm. to say their, you know, Ann did a wonderful job of uh, having multiple meetings with board, the, the full board, um, where several of these people didn't show up, actually, but uh, continued the process, didn't shut it down, you know, uh, mm -hmm. did a full investigation of people's concerns, uh, had it all, you know, a lot of sunlight, and a lot of discussion, and a lot of respect for people's feelings about um, change. Right, right. And uh, we came out the, the end, in the end pretty good. That's yeah. great. Other, other examples of uh, what, hmm. what didn't go right, and what would you maybe do differently? Um, I think just a, a few things. One is, um, <clears throat> I think that it takes a lot of time. Um, and so that community oh, outreach yes. and keeping your eye on all the stakeholder groups, all the constituency groups is key and really getting out in front of them, right? Um, so it's everything, it's students it fa and families, it's donors, it's the board and it's, it's community partners. And I think just really, really taking the time proactively to communicate, to sell ahead of time before it mm -hmm. becomes public, that's key. Mm -hmm. Two is egoless board chairs, mm -hmm. find them. <laughs> find them now. Um, it, was, it was the key to our success, honestly. And then the third thing is just, you know, keep your eye on the end game because I think that if all of the constituent groups believe that they're going to be getting a more metrics-driven, more robust, more comprehensive, kind of more resourced program in the end, right. you'll get the buy-in. Um, and they've got to see it and feel it. That was another big thing. Um, I think a mistake, problem. not a mistake, but I think if I were to invest, if we were to invest any time, I think it would be really trying to get each and every one of these constituent groups into the program. The program really sells itself. Mm -hmm. um, and we just needed, you know, more more of that. Right. But right. yeah, stick to the process, <clears throat> Alan. I would just say, um, one of the things, you, of course, that you do in the course of this dance is due diligence on each other, right? Because both organizations, in order to be responsible, need to understand that they're not taking on some hidden liability or some big problem that they don't know about that they're going to inherit. Uh, and so you you kind of have a lot of digging around. Um, and you do find problems, but you know that's both good and bad because uh, on the one hand, yeah, you have to you have to overcome them, but on the other hand, it's good to find them. And, and I think, frankly, we found some things in our own uh, organization and uh, that that were issues that needed yeah. to be fixed, and yeah. and so it became an occasion uh, to address those and to improve uh, our own processes and our and and so on as as we learned uh, from, from the experience. So I think, yeah, they, maybe there were some bumps in the road, but they, they turn out to be very constructive. Right, right. If you, if you mm. take advantage of that opportunity, right, right? and really right. be honest and authentic about looking at that. So Eileen, when you're not singing Kumbaya and holding yeah. hands with your partners, <laughs> when things don't go great, or what are the, what, talk about a learning that you've had over the years. Uh, well, I think, um, one of the things I've learned is, um, what, what do they say? What are the hardest things to do? Um, public speaking, uh, <laughs> divorce, <Thanks>. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess divorce, change jobs. And I think that um, managing that change, especially with yeah. your employees, is the most important thing. Because if the name is changing, or the board is changing, or management is changing, for them, there's a lot of anxiety. Um, yeah. And you have to go way deep and really, um, you know, spend time with them and, and think that through. So, yep. that's yep. what I would say. Please help me in thanking our guests today as we move into the Q and A session. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Really helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Okay, we're and if I could just say, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. Think Twitter, not War and Peace, <laughs> in your in your questions. <laughs> If a story is required, please make it quick and get to the question. That would be so helpful for us. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. We have mics up here. Wonderful. Thanks. We'll repeat it. Go ahead. How did you determine what was going to be the dominant culture, and how uh -huh. did you go into the forcing of it? 
How did you so, determine what was going to be the dominant culture and how did you force it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll just say in our case, it's different than some of the one, other ones you're talking about. In our case, it was very clear. There's one much larger organization is acquiring a smaller organization. Its name was going to disappear. Three of the board members came over. The rest of them were, were done. Um, and, and so there was no question about which was going to be the, the, um, the kind of surviving uh, organization. But, but one of the things that I thought was very important in, in kind of negotiating the deal, if you will, was that you know, we looked really hard at whether financially this was going to make sense. I mean, were we, were we sort of taking on something that was going to sink us here, or, or would were the, were the numbers work? And could you model it out in terms of donors and cash reserves and so on? Um, and one of the things I think you have to be very careful about is, is, not, is, is saying, look, the whole point here is to get economies of scale. If we continue to run both of these programs in parallel, uh, we're not going to have economies of scale. It's just going to cost, we're going to have the same budget uh, as the two former uh, organizations did. So, so you have to really sort of step up to your point about cu cultural consolidation that, you know, yeah, you did it this way and we did it that way, but we need to do it one way. We can't. We can't keep doing it in two different ways because if we do, this isn't going to this isn't going to work. It feels like a real opportunity to co-create something together, a new thing. What's the what's the what's the new thing we're going to be together versus one is well, going to dominate the other two? For, uh, you good? Yeah, other questions yeah. uh, in the back there, and then Kathleen. I can't see. Sorry. Your Hi, lit. Sandy Walker, YMCA of Silicon Valley. Thanks for your thoughtful, good work on this area of merger and joining together. I'd love you to talk a bit about how you navigated the boards coming together. Because the organization and the staff side is one thing, but I'd love to hear how you completed the board merger and what was your resolution. And my second question, if you have a moment, is when did you know it was truly completed? It's one thing to get the business side done, but when did you know you were truly one? Are we done yet? Yeah. 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 I, I, I could try to take that on. I, what we have found is uh, you want to select um, a cohort of each board. Uh, it's just numbers, right? So usually three or four from each board uh, will be selected, and then that group will become uh, the working group, if you will. Uh, another thing I should mention is another resource we've relied on in most of our mergers is an outside facilitator who's taking us through a process. So there's someone who's objective in the room, who's taking notes and keeping us um, mm. in line. So that, um, that has, that's actually a really, in, in my experience of doing four of these, there's a moment where people go, ah, yeah, we're, to get, we're doing this together. And mm -hmm. so you just kind of mm -hmm. organically mm -hmm. know that. Um, but you, to your question, when you know you're finished with the, uh, merger, uh, it could be years later. The CWG uh, Strategic Alliance uh, is not a completed uh, <clears throat> uh, alliance because we're still working out issues. We had hoped to uh, do some things we're not able to do because the marketplace has changed and, and opportunities aren't there. So um, I think it's better actually to leave it open then, to not say it's done. It's actually, we haven't got to all the things we wanted to do and keep it an open question and have it part of the board, the new board's ongoing conversation. Right, right. So logistics can be done, but not necessarily. I mean, the partnership and the Precisely. evolution of that continues. Yeah. Right? Other questions? Or Kathleen. Uh, so, I, you know, I could see we, we could deal with the board and the staff and all that. How did you deal with your data? I think there's one thing <laughs> we would not true. give up is <clears throat> we have 200,000 services in Salesforce mm -hmm. with 15 pieces of data on each. So have, have you run it's into that question. problem? That's a great question. No, thank you. Yeah, we were lucky in that both organizations use Salesforce. It actually wasn't that complicated. So we were able to bring on you know an IT consultant to help us merge. The data integration piece, we still have files. <laughs> it's hysterical, paper files. Um, but we have been scanning, you know, each of the student profiles basically into Salesforce. It wasn't that it wasn't super complicated, just because the numbers so for we us. Could, we could combine with you. We could partner. 
<laughs> We'd be delighted. But it's a great hey, question. Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a We're great ready. question to ask. After the meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the donors as well. We did the same on the donor side. So the donor integration, we made sure, obviously, that you know everything was, was merged and integrated over. But it was less complicated than we anticipated. It's not inexpensive either. I mean, especially if you're yeah. going from somebody that's got a razor's edge or a whatever to a sales force. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a serious consideration. We, um, we actually had improvements in those areas uh, because the organizations we were with didn't have much in the way of data collection. And in the homeless housing arena, uh, most of the data now is unified in a, in a county-based system. So we were able to get data actually into that system that wasn't there before, making it a win-win for the community. Uh, so that, that actually was one of the easier lifts for us in our mergers. Right. Again, can we create something together that may be better ultimately mm -hmm. right. Right. For, for our clients and for both parties involved? Yes, question. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm Camille Kennedy, VP of Strategic Partnerships for Avenidas. And my question is more around the things that weren't existing prior to your merger. So it's the strategic initiatives that I, both organizations had, sort of like the things in the future that they were hoping to accomplish. Did those things align? Because I feel like that would be the piece that would be the most important looking into the future as the marketplace shifts and changes and so many additional uh, organizations come into the, into the marketplace. So how did that blend? I'm talking about college. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, both, a couple of examples. They, BFN uh, was starting with third graders, we were starting with fourth graders. And uh, we, went, we stuck with fourth grade, but we've started doing more earlier, because that's, that's an example of taking something that they had done that we thought was a pretty good idea and trying to figure it out. The other one that I would cite uh, even bigger is uh, college. So one of the things that's emerged in college, across, I think, a lot of college access organizations in, in the last few years is realizing that getting kids into college isn't nearly enough. You've got to get them through college. And uh, uh, that's a lot harder than it might seem if you haven't tried. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so both of our organizations were very focused on that in terms of initiatives, in terms of how, what, what do we need to do, how, what more can we do and can we afford to do to, to build out the college uh, program. And, and that is something that we definitely s s kept right out in front of us and really focused on significantly. So you were able to blend those pretty, pretty yeah. easily yeah. We, we And we, we absorbed their 100 kids into our program and, and some of those kids were high school seniors right. and so uh, that it fed right into this initiative of building a stronger college program. Uh, Eileen, I would ask too, just in terms of, and we're talking a lot here about mergers and there may be people in the room that are not looking to merge but just really playing with the idea of collaborating with other organizations. So I wanna uh, put you on the spot and see, <laughs> and see if there are examples uh, that you can share about programmatic uh, collaboration and really future visioning with, uh, uh, with other organizations. It might be helpful. Sure, sure. Um, I think um, about, to your question about the strategic uh, um, future, uh, it's e easy for us in homeless services, right? It's to end homelessness, so, um, and we have to be lean and spelt and move, um, but, but we never take our eye off of that ball, and that takes a, a lot of different expertises and agencies um, to do that. Um, we also have had a couple of uh, programs like um, Rapid Rehousing, where we would partner with different, uh, even landlords actually, um, and have um, a subsidy for a year or two for our folks while they're on our team and then they get a job. Um, and 88.9% of those folks exited homelessness after two years. Um, not all paying their own rent here in the Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. but uh, two, two couples got married, so that helped with the rent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we had to have um, housing partners that understood who our folks were, um, believed in where we were heading with them, um, and knew that they could call us you know, for case management 24-7 and we would we'd be there to help them. So they had to be bought into our vision as well. And it feels like it's really part of that you know, exploratory process, right? Are, are, we gonna, are, are we good partners? You know, where are you headed? Where, will, where are we headed? 
what's I, I, I would add, I think this, for, so the role of the executive director in a strategic alliance is really about a vision for the two entities going forward. That's what I've learned. It's yeah. like mm -hmm. the board at some point looks at me and says, <laughs> How, we're going to be more than just one plus one, and i got to come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, so I think that's, a lot of you are executives, it's important to think about that. And um, quite frankly, um, at least two of our mergers have been really strategic alliances, have been really powerful in that way. Getting into business areas or location as well as um, the, the, the horizontally, the, 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 uh, the intervention that we wanted to expand or work in. And, and we moved faster in, uh, into those areas because of the strategic alliance. And it came from vision first. I have to say, it's a sort of some dreaming. This is where you dream. This is your opportunity to say, wow, what if we you know, really could move the field forward by creating more housing in San Jose? Um, there's no one really doing that right now for homeless people, but let's think about what if we were the one to do that? And three projects later, you realize, yeah, actually, we've made some progress towards it. Other questions? The glasses, Barbara. right there. Barbara? Barbara? Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone. I had a question to follow up on the data um, merging, which has to do with metrics. So it sounds like some of you guys have very much overlapping uh, outcome, desired outcomes, some maybe more complementary. But how did you take advantage or not, or, or meet the challenge of merging your way of measuring your outcomes? I, I think for Bridge, we actually had a more robust evaluation um, sort of process uh, in, in place. Um, and it was something actually that, that BFN had been wanting to strengthen. Um, so they were enthusiastic in, in kind of looking at the system that we, we had put in place. They, were, they had been focused on sort of pre and post tests, the academic gains. Mm -hmm. They hadn't really looked, though, at the non-cognitive skill development and kind of the, the non-academic gains. And so I think what was exciting for them is they were looking at that, you know, back to your point, as an opportunity um, for growth. I think we had some, some longitudinal data that they were excited about. So we were able, I think, to strengthen, you know, kind of strengthen the evaluation process and the outcomes piece. Mm -hmm. We've been able to, so add on to my previous answer, we, there's scaling that's happened for us. So we're, we have a data team now of eight staff members. Um, when I started with the organization, I was doing data. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it wasn't pretty, I'm sure. You know. <laughs> But so, so now we have, you know, these are, are people really uh, qualified in that field and able to uh, interact with the government entities that we participate with to, to collect that data. So it takes a certain amount of scale to get at some excellence there. And I, that's our experience that growth and strategic alliance and partnerships have allowed us mm -hmm. to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, if, for those of you that have blended organizations or programs, and, and the how long does that process, just the data process take, the data and evaluation mm -hmm. process? And we talk about formal merging, mm -hmm. through, you know, you all did it pretty quickly. It can take a long time. It can seem never ending. But just that logistical part, I'm curious what you found. I would, I, you know, again, um, <laughs> so last month I had my 25th anniversary with at Abode Services. And yeah. Um, thank you. Spraying <laughs> <laughs> in, in place, I call it. So, so, one of the, so I had these experiences of going through these processes, and I remember being resistant, a typical uh, executive director being resistant to the county owning the data uh, within. So HUD requires that homeless uh, counts and information sit with the county uh, uh, coordinated care, uh, mm -hmm. continuum of care board. And so I remember fighting and said, well, our agency should control that. Why do we, well, you know, and 25 years later, it. my re <laughs> reflection is, wow, how powerful it is not to have to own that whole system yeah. monetarily, mm -hmm. but also, so to answer the question, what has happened is when we add a new program, it's seamless. Maybe my staff would say something different, but <laughs> from, from, from my a, view, from your it seems seamless. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Yeah, I, uh, coming from the software industry, mm -hmm. I have seen implementations uh, <laughs> fail yeah. over and over again or yeah. not live up to the hype. Yeah. And so we've been laggards, honestly, in data at Downtown Streets mm -hmm. team. Um, we know how many jobs and how, how many people we've housed. Um, but for us, it's more about rebuilding dignity. So how do you measure that? Yeah. And it's been very difficult. Um, so we are doing uh, anonymous surveys, um, optional uh, surveys, uh, every six months. And so we're getting some of those numbers, like 96% of the people have less interaction with the law, um, have better health outcomes and all of that. Um, but I believe this is my bias. Um, that we're a little data crazy right now, and I think that things are gonna flip back over. Um, I think we need to do data and should, but um, you can't take a homeless person and give them a number and then uh, decide what services are right for them. So for me, I feel very strongly about that. So I wouldn't, well, anyway, that's it. <laughs> a whole other world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got time for one more question. That somebody has <laughs> that's yes. next. Um, hi, Amy with the Hill Project in San Mateo County. I just wanted to know if one Hello. Um, if yeah. one were to propose a merger with uh, someone you're already collaborating with, what should one bring to the table at the initial meeting? Because you were saying how the BFN yeah. um, ED was so well prepared. Like, what did she have? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. She uh, first of all, they had uh, their they had a committee of their board who had studied. Uh, the other participants in, in sort of the, our space mm -hmm. in the area, and it was kind of a compliment actually. She, they said, and we picked you because we thought, I don't know if she really, maybe we were the second choice, I don't know, but she said that we were the first choice. <laughs> and, uh, and why? You know, in other words, she had, she had her reasons as to why she thought we were the best fit, we would be, this would be the, the most appropriate combination. Uh, why their strategy and our strategy were were very consistent and so on. So that it, it, may, it, it was it was right out of the box, not crazy. And then the other thing, of course, is financial because you you naturally recoil. You know, wow, how's this going to work? Uh, uh, but she had thought about it enough in terms of donors and their cash reserves and their budget and. So on that that she could say you know you, you need to study this but it looks to us like it could possibly work and you wouldn't you know you wouldn't be ruining yourself financially if you took if you took us on uh, and that obviously is very reassuring then to think okay well this isn't nuts so let's spend some time on it taking a good inventory of, mm -hmm. of what you have and bringing that to mm -hmm. the table mm -hmm. yeah any other thoughts on that guys yeah I I think that. Um, it's really important to spend a lot of time thinking about what you're looking for, what your organization's looking for. So, we, uh, particularly if you're the smaller organization, um, so that you don't come into the conversation um, that feels like it's about being swallowed. Yeah. I mean, and because that's really, it shouldn't be that. And if you come in that way, it's going to be that way. So, think about what your strengths are, what your weaknesses, what you have to offer. What you what you need, um, and I the, the last thing I would say too is process, process, process. You know, trust the process. Do a process. I've seen I've seen people do partnerships with no process at all. You know, it's not just a handshake. It starts with coffee. Mm -hmm. It does. It is relational to start with. I mean, you got to trust the people you're working with, but you know, move quickly mm -hmm. to a to an objective process, and that'll answer your questions and the other folks' questions. Thanks to the four of you so much. Stay here, don't move, but we are gonna move into a dialogue with each other about some of the things we've heard and some of the things I'm sure are percolating uh, as we listen to, uh, to this conversation. Um, I, wanna, I wanna turn it to you all now and challenge you with a question here. At a recent ALF event, we did this, this exercise where uh, we have a bunch of our alumni come to an annual event and we, we had these name badges. And on one side of the name badge, you had to say what I have to give, so you could write that down. Before you could get in the event, what I have to give. And on the other side, it said what I hope to receive. What I have to give and what I hope to receive as a part of the ALF network, but in this case, the human network and the sector that we are in. So I, I want you to reflect on your answers to that question. What, what do I have to give? What does my organization have? What's our greatest asset? 
What, is, what, are, what are we best in practice at? And then what do I, in pure, uh, purely you know, authentic and, and somewhat vulnerable state here, what, what do I hope to get? What do we need to be successful and to get to mission? So what I'd like you to do is, if sheets of paper at every seat, yes, we have a list. Um, find some paper, share with a neighbor, <laughs> and write down some of these reflections, okay? What do I have to give, and what do I hope to receive? And then what I'd like you to do is find a partner, hopefully somebody you don't know. Somebody you don't know, okay? And talk about it. Share with each other. We've got about 15 minutes for this exercise. Yep. Move around if you need to. Have a deep dive and share. I had, a, I had a quick question I was going to ask. All right, let's see. Oh, yeah. Good point. It's the top. Oh, there it is. Thanks. Good point. Like so. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, gang. Let's wrap up your conversation. Okay, gang. Let's finish your thoughts and wrap up your conversation so that we can do a group share out. So much wisdom in the room today. It's on. It's on. Okay, what did we learn today? What are our pearls of wisdom that we're gonna take with us today? Let's uh, get the microphone around to maybe a couple of folks who have some learnings to share. What do I have to give? What do I hope to receive from this group of inspired leaders today? Who would like to, uh, to share a couple pearls of wisdom? Perhaps they learned about themselves. Or about another organization, Kim Riley. I can't imagine this group is a bunch of introverted, shy people. I don't know. That's just my guess. Yes. Thank you. So um, I will speak. Um, so uh, all the people in the room, um, uh, Valerie. Oh, it's not working. I think it's on. Is yeah. it? Can people hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That just might be my voice. It carries. I'm from the East Coast. Um, <laughs> so of all the people in the room who would come sit next to me, I, again, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Avenidas, and yeah. Valerie Tama, who is on the board of La Comida, just came and sat next to me. <laughs> so um, that's interesting, I right? And, um, I, but I think it's, it's kind of awesome, right? So, and it's awesome because I joined Avenidas in September of last year, so after the segmenting of the two organizations, uh, the, the okay. segmentation of the two organizations. What is interesting, I said that again, um, is that, you know, what is the conversation when two organizations were together and now we're apart, mm -hmm. and fine, and, but both have to answer now all of the same questions that they had prior, right? So mm. La Comida is in a position. A demerger. De right? Mm -hmm. So La Comida is in a position now for the first time where they have to actively fundraise, right? right? And, and, um, hmm? You're welcome. And, and, and Benavenides is always fundraised. Right, yeah. and Avenidas has, has always tried to figure out how it could be everything to all seniors in a community, which is almost impossible. But what is the line of conversation back towards a, I think, a fundamental um, uniqueness of what the two organizations had together, okay. but remaining separate, right? right? So sometimes mergers don't work. Sometimes mergers work, but mission shifts or mm -hmm. demand shift. And then things come apart, but then they find that they can come back together in alignment, right? right. But two separate organizations and other. both in complement each other, right? right? So right. it's kind of like in the odd um, <laughs> place where people get divorced and they're like, "Hey, but we can be best friends, co-parent, and live in." <laughs> <laughs> I have a friends analogy. Oh yeah, right. they can do oh, that. Yeah. So it's, sure. I think it's similar. And your first name again? Sorry, Val. I'm Valérie Talma. Did you sit next to um, uh, her on purpose? Absolutely. Because okay. <laughs> sometimes I have to say, and I was just sharing with Lisa this, I went to a workshop recently where it was just kind of magical how you would sit next to a stranger. It's like, you're just the person I needed to sit next to. Right? So sometimes there's magic in the air, but yes. And that, to me, is a great example, frankly, of, hey, been there, done that, and hey, let's, let's dive in and talk about this. What worked, what didn't, what do we, how do we complement each other in this space? So thanks for sharing. Appreciate that. Other pearls of wisdom, but what you learned about, about yourself, your organization, uh, or perhaps uh, uh, the other. Even if you want to share, like, hey, this is what we bring to the table, and this is what we hope to, to offer and to give, whether it's in a programmatic collaboration or a full-out merger, strategic alliance. <coughs> Kathleen. So. We didn't totally stick with the script. Shocking. But. <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> but um, on either side of me is involved in education, and it's, and it's about getting young people through college. Mm -hmm. 
And I think they may have a way to go leverage resources at the college. Okay. So maybe not, not partner necessarily as uh, sharing business together, but figuring out how to get these resources at the college that help our young people mm -hmm. get through and just listening to them. It's, it's a scary, prop I mean, it's a scary area to make sure that they're all getting through college. So. Do you mind sharing what organizations you're from? So I'm from East Charter Schools in uh, San Jose. And I'm from 10,000 Degrees. I guess I would just, just add in general, I think a lot mm -hmm. of what we talked about as well is, you know, what is the mission? And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. our mission is to get students to and through college. And so how do we do that in a way that collaborates across and just thinking creatively about how best to manage it? How does that work? What we didn't get to is I want to hire them after they get through <laughs> college because I have 50% of my employees are first-time college grads in their family. Okay, that's a win right there. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's great. There's a collaboration. Other thoughts, feedback? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Maureen with Downtown Streets team as well, and I was sitting next to Jody, um, and Jody was talked. We were both talking about um, how our organizations are working to change perceptions. Um, mm -hmm. Jody works with uh, autism, or in autism, trying to change the perception of what people with autism have to offer to the community, right. um, and. Um, working in homelessness, I think that we also are really working hard to change the perception of what people who are experiencing homelessness have to offer to the community that they belong in. Yeah. And um, I thought it was very interesting because we talk about collaboration all morning on a, on a, a high scale, right? right. With um, everybody that's involved um, in the program, but also, you know, the board and the employees and everything. But I think of collaboration, um, everybody in the room, everybody that I meet, everybody on the bus, anybody that lives in the city, um, because we need their buy-in um, to agree that, yes, these people have belong here and they have something to offer. And so um, I try and keep, um, in Downtown Street team, we call them our team members, um, I try and keep them in the foreground of my thought and, and in my mouth at all times. Do you have a comment too, too? <laughs> you know, it occurs to me, too, having been in television for 25 years prior to my current career, shout out to VMI, by the way, <laughs> love you guys, <laughs> worked with you a lot over the years, um, the importance of sharing these resources about communication and perception. I mean, you two are in very different kind of worlds in terms of your organizations and, and who you serve, but there's some commonality there about how do we share storytelling? How do we share those resources and the communication resources to benefit our constituents? Well, it's connecting people to yeah. the, to um, the people we serve, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's storytelling. Storytelling. And it's yep. it's really getting them to see this is a yep. part of the human condition. That's right. You know. Um, That's right. And making that connection. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. You had a, a question or comment? Yep. So, uh, Charlie Wydan, CEO of Abilities United. And uh, Charlie Wyden, and CEO of Abilities United, w one of our needs, of course, is fundraising. And yeah. would a, did the partnership or alliance improve your fundraising? Did grantors see that you, as, a, as a new agency you could do more and they would fund it differently? And, uh, did your, and how did your donors, <laughs> and how did your individual donors react once the merger happened? One second on that. I just want to make sure as we move out of this part about sharing what you sh what you talked about. Did anybody else have a comment on that? Or looked like we were kind of wrapping up there. Okay. What we'd like to do is, yeah, let's move into Q&A. Final round of questions, which I may ask a couple. But Lightning round. Please. Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. No, um, okay. Eileen. Yes. Go. So um, my side hustle is running the medical clinic at the Opportunity Center um, in 2000. And <laughs> <laughs> Side hustle. Side hustle. <laughs> All right. Everybody's got one, yeah. Um, it, they were going through some issues about fundraising in uh, 2009, asked me to help them out for a month or two. And so here we are today. How'd that work? Um, <laughs> how many years? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But I see uh, both Downtown Streets team and the medical clinic and potential health care as a sort of next step up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs after the safety net. So, um, mm -hmm. But I purposefully have kept the both agencies separate um, because of fundraising. I remember back in the day when Envision, before they were Envision, they had a different name. And as they kept acquiring um, new little businesses in the Palo Alto area and throughout Santa Clara County, you know, you don't get, sorry, Cami, but you don't get um, $10,000 from, you know, five times now. You get $10,000 once from the Palo Alto Community Fund. I don't know where she is, but um, so, so <laughs> we get, you know, 10,000 and 10,000 usually. Um, however, some people say, what are you doing, Eileen? Like, which one are, you know, you're running? Uh, right, Joe Simidian right. says I have, uh, I don't know. Anyway, multiple personality <laughs> disorder or something. Um, but, I, but I did that on purpose, yeah. and it's worked out extremely well. So I think the answer is um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard, and you must know. Lewis. Yeah, I, I, I think we've done very well at the, uh, adding value around fundraising. And I think it has, we were chatting earlier about just the, the, the Bay Area and giving from the, from the business community, for example. Um, you know. Uh, still trying to get focused uh, on the local problems that we have here. We have very serious uh, local mm -hmm. problems in it. Uh, there's some major leadership, uh, Sobrato being one of them. Uh, Cisco recently gave a $50 million gift to a uh, destination home uh, to address homelessness. But I think we have a long ways to go, and, and I don't think that it's really in our hands, uh, quite frankly. We've got to continue to tell our story. We've got to uh, engage with folks. But I think the culture of the Bay Area has got to make a shift um, around our local issues. And I don't, think it's gonna, I don't think we have a lot of control over it, is my perspective. I just want to say our donors loved it. Um, it was really, it addressed the economies of scale. I think it really addressed the duplication, the replication issue. I mean, it's crazy, right? In East Palo Alto, I think there are 250 youth development organizations in a 2.5 mile square radius, right? And we're all getting funded by the same donors. Mm -hmm. So they absolutely loved it. I think we were absolutely able to show the added value, right? And the mission alignment was so obvious. Um, and we were really able to deepen impact <clears throat> and expand partnerships, I'm so sorry, in East Palo Alto. <clears throat> so we did that pre-sale ahead of time and we actually met with all the major donors of Building Futures Now ahead of time. Um, to share the story, and they were really excited on the front end. Um, so I think there was really added value, and I think donors really appreciate the, the merger. Helen, did you have a comment to add to that? Or? Well, um, yeah, one other thing, which is that scale helps. I mean, so there's that. You know, there's sort of looking at your, the existing base of donors that are supporting and then saying, and now maybe by being bigger, uh, we start to access another another group of donors who right. w wouldn't have been interested in us because they didn't see us as being sufficiently impactful, no. right. uh, and and so you you know you get that additional benefit as well potentially. And the reason we're here too, I just want to call out that this workshop and this idea came about because mm -hmm. you know several funders who were involved uh, in the planning of this event said God, we've got a lot of duplication coming across the desk, right? Mm -hmm. We're reading all these grant applications. We recognize mm -hmm. that there's a lot of duplication in particular service areas. How can we help our sector think about combining, working collaboratively, being more efficient around that? Um, I will also share that a couple of, couple, well, about a year ago, I had lunch with a, a gal who's a, a social impact investor and you know, I have a lot of respect for and, and is very involved as a philanthropist and on boards and you know, I'm sitting and having lunch with her and she said, if one more Stanford grad student shows up to me and says he's starting his own nonprofit and wants to do <laughs> my head's gonna spin off and I said, really interesting, right? Are we measuring the landscape? Are we really surveying that? Or are we caring about our brand, our vision, or bust, right? So, so I, I, wanna, I wanna pose a question here uh, along this, this line of questioning. Um, is there anything that philanthropy can do to help encourage this more? Is there anything that philanthropy can do, foundations, government can do, to not impose collaborations upon us, but to support them? If you could say anything right now, 
In fact, you can. Mm -hmm. um, to folks that are, are that care, want to invest in this, what would you say? What sets you all up for success and our community up for success? This will sound like brown nosing, <laughs> and it is. But the Sobrato Family Foundation and other foundations who have figured out that it's general support, that's the first rule. Uh, we still, I, you know, I worked all last week with a large foundation going through their uh, hoops in order to get a gift. And I have to say, it just, it felt diminishing after the process. I had to say things that were honest, but they were like up to the threshold <laughs> of what we could do. And am I telling the truth? I mean, that's, that's what we do, right? And so no I would say that, anything, that for <laughs> general support, don't, you know, we know our business. Um, yeah. Invest, and that's the other thing I would say, invest in good nonprofits who are scaled, who are doing the work, and quite frankly, um, as, <laughs> as a funder said to me who had been in homeless work, you go to a large nonprofit doing this sort of work, scratch the surface and there's a big mess underneath because we don't have enough infrastructure. So we need to be supported that way, and so I, that's, that's my thoughts about what and I would And in say. terms of funding for collaboration, so, yeah. yeah. Someone likes that. <laughs> um, in terms of funding for collaborative efforts, I mean, I think that, that the, the SVCN number, around 15 to 20% of the programmatic budget, needs to go towards this. These costs are real. The time is real. The investment is real. Um, other thoughts on, on how philanthropy and, and, and you know, government can help in this endeavor? Uh, what, what doesn't work is them trying to force us to work yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're the fan. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. And I hate to say this, but you, you touched on it, Lewis, just now, but we know our business better than anyone. And so the right kind of investor is somebody that says, mm. I dig you and your leadership, and here's a million dollars to scale. And that happened to Downtown Streets Team. Um, and it is one of the reasons that we've scaled mm. the way we have. Um, and I will also say that I think philanthropy is changing in that more people are starting to get general operating funds and they're also starting to think like, hey, this you know this business better than us. I'm here um, to support you in any way I can. Uh, Google is another example of that kind of investor. Um, so there's a couple leaders out there that are taking very serious their leadership in changing philanthropy. Um, I know I'm not going to say any names, but somebody during the break just told me that she spent 60 hours doing a grant application and got turned down. It's ridiculous. Um, I don't care how much that was for. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's important too. Yeah. 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 So if, if we, if funders see or, or government sees that collaboration is, is important, viable, could create more efficiencies, how do they set you up for success versus forcing it? Well, I, I mentioned, you know, we got, there are these, there are these sort of one-time costs uh, of doing a consolidation, yeah. Yeah. even if you, even if you, and and the the you mentioned yeah. facilitator consultants, right, exactly. uh, yeah. you're going to have some additional uh, accounting expenses. There's the severance issue. Um, these are, you know, you, you're measuring that against okay, but over the long run, we think this is going to be uh, financially worthwhile because of economies of scale and so on. But there's this big bite at the time you do it. And getting grants to cover that yeah. is really important. And Sobrato, is, as I mentioned, did that for us. Uh, Sand Hill did it. I think uh, one last yeah. thing, too, is sure. use, using your funders as sounding mm -hmm. boards and advisors. Before we decided to do this merger, we actually reached out to two or three of our, you know, our favorite, <laughs> favorite funders, Sobrato being one of them, and asked them advice. What do you think of this? Mm -hmm. You know, BFN has come to us asking us um, about a merger possibility. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? What do you know? What do they do well? Um, what's their expertise, what's their value proposition. And I think that's really, really key on, on so many fronts is using donors and funders really to, to, as, as advisors, um, not, not only as funders. Final thoughts, questions? Judy, do you have one? That's a great point. Yeah. Before we take another poll. <laughs> <laughs> Polls are so much fun. Uh, Judy Koch, Bring Me a Book Foundation. Just to answer your question on how nonprofits can engage funders. For example, we have Judy Crate sitting next to me who manages just partnerships. Uh, um, uh, and it's easy for us because we're about book access, so it's easy to have partnerships, I have to admit. But the Morgan Family Foundation funds that partner that that mm -hmm. position, part-time position, because they want to see us collaborate. 
And we don't do anything without a partnership because we have somebody who just manages that. Uh, but my, my other question is, how I think if we have more visibility of who's doing what, it would help us to see who we can collaborate. So example, in East Palo Alto, 220 nonprofits. I think John Gardner or some organization at one time did a survey in East Palo Alto to try to identify all the nonprofits working in certain sectors. Is there anything that's current or up to date that would give us more visibility of who's doing what so that we can see who there's, that we have things in common with that we can work together on? What a fantastic question. I do have a comment on it, but I'll let you guys. I think it's a terrific idea. I would just add to that that um, we consider our uh, strategic alliances open source. So if you want to talk to us about our experiences, our, you know, these experiences are painful. So we want to share them so that uh, <laughs> they're, they're not made over and over again. Misery loves it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that doing a scan of the areas um, yeah. that, that's particularly where, uh, and there's certain, I've noticed, we're, Ann and I were talking about education right now. It just seems like there's so many folks in that space uh, it would be great if someone funded like a scan to figure you out what's going You know what, too, Judy? Yes. Is we um, just and, and for for folks here. I mean, ALF is very deep in the work of putting together a network map. And think of a map that allows you to search education or arts or you know whatever your cause is. And for us, for our purposes, it's really about being able to see. Okay, oh, Eileen's in. The, oh, look at this organization. Who are they connected to? So it's a visual that is searchable and really displays okay. the landscape. And I can say our program director is doing exactly what you, you're talking about with nonprofits up in Oregon. And he's piloting that right now, which is, mm -hmm. I've seen the pilot of it. It's fantastic because it does give you that, that kind of visual that you can search and awesome. can see the connections and, and make some decisions about collaboration. So maybe it's something we should look at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, ALF, we're doing, we're, we're doing something for our own network of 730 graduates, right? But that tool that's being built, in, we're basing it off of this tool being built in, in Bend, Oregon, and getting a little bit of pressure, honestly, about what if we did that here? What might that look like? Because it is, it is needed. It's, there's so much, right? One more question. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry, I didn't realize that he had a mic already. Yes. Ron Orozco from uh, Alameda County Community Food Bank. Um, quick question from a client's perspective. After you were done with your mergers or your collaboration, can you share maybe one or two things from a client's perspective in terms of the need was actually met, it was great, it came out the way you guys envisioned it, and maybe one or two things that didn't work out that you realized, well, even after this merger, the client, A, B, or C, you know, need didn't get met? Sure. Um, so it's broad, but, uh, you know, I think because of a lack of scaling with the organizations we came together with, in almost every case, we were able to improve the experience of the uh, participants and programs. And that may be philosophy. So for example, one of the things that um, we have found is having a core philosophy that is, uh, really respects the dignity of our clients. So much like downtown streets, mm -hmm. we found over time that we have to be very committed to that and do training, orientation and training of our staff. And so in some of these, uh, uh, a couple of these strategic alliances, we had staff who maybe didn't have uh, that sort of training and preparation for respect and of the dignity of folks. They were doing a, a job, basically. So uh, I, I think the, if you interviewed participants in, in the programs afterwards, you'd probably get uh, quite a bit of feedback about improvement of their experience in that area. So I think for us on the front end, what was interesting is we had Peninsula Bridge students and families actually at these community outreach meetings, and they were there selling the program and talking about the quality of the program, the quality of the staff, and the connection with the staff. So it was really interesting. We were super transparent. We would let you know Building Future Now students and families ask any and all questions. Um, you know, and we we I think that really helped on the front end. Um, they knew that they were getting a, a, a year-round program, an academic program, an enrichment program um, that was a, a little more robust, more rigorous than what they were used to. Um, so that was the added value for them and a lot of parent education at every phase, middle school, high school, to college, through college. A, a need that wasn't met though, and this is something um, 
that, that was a little bit of a challenge is we were pulling the program out of East Palo Alto originally. So we were supporting these students and families from East Palo Alto, but our programs were actually out of East Palo Alto. And there was some rub there. There was some real, real concern. Why are you pulling out of East Palo Alto? Why aren't you going to have a facility in P East Palo Alto? Um, and basically, you know, what we reassured them was is that the, the location, the locale, offered more resources. Um, it was just a deeper partnership outside of East Palo Alto. We were going to provide the buses. We were going to provide, you know, extended snacks, kind of all the rest. But we would be back in East Palo Alto at some point in time. And we actually did just go back to East Palo Alto just now, actually, in September. Uh, we've got an after-school program back, back at a school, East Palo Alto Phoenix Academy. Um, and so again, I think that reassurance, a really clear and solid timeline. Um, we're leaving temporarily. Um, we hear your concern. We're going to be back. And, and that real clear communication, um, proactive on the front end, a really clear timeline. Um, and then a big celebration once we got back. So that was, that was a little bit of a, a concern. And bringing your clients in to help tell the story. Exactly. Right? I think that's yeah. a really interesting, um, interesting approach and successful, it sounds like. So we are going to wrap. Please help me in thanking Louis Shequin from Abode. Mm -hmm. Andy Shaffin, out in Los Angeles. Awesome. We're going to take a quick poll, guys, because data does matter, and we want to know what you're mm -hmm. thinking. But here's the good news. We're evaluating Sorry. the session, and we're not going to see it all up here. It's going to be a confidential poll, I'm told, so that Sobrato can evaluate this workshop and hopefully offer some some wonderful learnings for, for all of us for our sector in the future. So please uh, answer this first question. Did you learn anything during this event that could be implemented uh, into your work or that could benefit your organization? Answer that one. We'll just give you a minute. I think we have a couple questions here. We're Four sitting right here, I Suzanne. So I know. We're sitting right here. No, I'm sorry. I know, it's not going to show just... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know. Okay. Just give it a minute here for you to answer this one. If you're a little lost in how to do this, don't be afraid to ask for help. Okay? Shall we move on to the second question? Okay? I think we're moving on to the second question. Okay. Good. We're trying. Oh, is it? Okay. Got it. There we go. A couple results coming. To what extent did this session deepen your understanding of developing collaborations? Getting a look under the hood, Sarah said, which I like that phrase. <laughs> Making sausage. How does it actually happen? Awesome. Appreciate you all answering that. Great. Let's go on to the next one, I think. Or are we still totally? Okay, great. How would you rate the session overall? Wouldn't it be fun if the results were showing and we could <laughs> <have> just <laughs> So I just said, kidding. we're sitting right here, Suzanne. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah. I'm following the rules <laughs> for once. <laughs> and then I think we got one more just in terms of feedback regarding how we can improve future sessions that's coming up. I believe we have a 15-minute break and there's a... a, a a group of us that are going to go across the way for a, uh, a workshop, folks that registered separately for that. But otherwise, I think we're going to hang out for a few if folks have questions and want to uh, engage in some conversations. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you, you have some takeaways and some inspiration to, to take with you today. Thank you. Thanks to Sobrato, Palo Alto Community Foundation.